So it's absolutely wonderful to be here. And I am noting the irony of building an entire career based on my voice and being on the brink of laryngitis. <laughs> and so I want to ask you in advance to forgive me for sounding like I'm going through puberty. <laughs> I am not. Um, I do think that I'll be able to speak enough. And thankfully, you're mostly here to hear these ladies, so we'll be fine. Um, the official title of this session is Unlocking Resources to Accelerate Impact in Unprecedented Times. And the way I've come to think of it in my head is really just never waste a good crisis, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that the people here have figured out how to crack the code, how to not be debilitated by moments that feel um, maximally full of human suffering, depressive, paralyzing. It's actually something interestingly I think this room has in common. So many of us when we hear certain words today feel like the world is falling apart. Like I say climate, it's not neutral. I say women or gender, it's not neutral. You know, I say water, it's not neutral. We have these associations and anxiety, but so many of the people in this room have figured out how to flip a switch inside of you so that you're not simply or primarily paralyzed but you're figuring out what can I do in the face of suffering at scale. And our panelists have been cracking that code diligently. We're in Oxford right now, and there is a famed godfather of British venture capital. His name is Sir Ronald Cohen. Interestingly, he arrived in England as an Egyptian refugee as a child, and he came to head VC in this country. And he has the thesis that in a fairly short period of time, all investment is going to become impact investment. He says, just like risk and reward became measured by financiers in the early 20th century, in this century we're going to figure out the measurements for impact and they're going to become a piece of how all money is used across sectors. And as I read his book and came to understand his thesis, I thought about the grassroots work it takes for something like that to actually happen the on the ground scratching away at power and sort of you know exploiting your space at boundaries i think as each of you are doing and so i think that if that thesis comes true it's going to be because of work like yours i'll introduce each of you briefly and then we'll get into a conversation followed by q a okay so we'll start with archana sigal she is founder and president of hyphen she served in the Obama White House in the Office of Public Engagement and the Department of Commerce. She's also worked in foundations at Democracy Alliance, Open Society Foundations, NOAA Foundation, San Francisco Foundation, like I said, many foundations. She's also led the creation of the political arm for the National Immigration Law Center, a very big and important nonprofit in the US. Um, she works at the intersection of government, philanthropy, and the nonprofit sector, and Hyphen is trying to figure out how to leverage the positioning between these sector sectors to get resources to marginalized communities. Next, I'll introduce Nana Sabarwal Bathra. She is CEO of Asian Venture Philanthropy Network. Over the last decade, she has grown her base by more than five, uh, four, uh, four X and expanded into more than a dozen countries across Asia. She too is breaking silos, expanding from venture philanthropy to support the entire ecosystem of social investors, uh, catalytic philanthropists, impact investors, corporate CSR professionals. She's been instrumental in developing an approach that brings people together into collaborative pooled funds. In 2021, she was featured in the list of Asia's most influential by Tatler Asia, very fancy, and in 2019, awarded one of Asia's top sustainability superwomen by CSR uh, Works. Finally, I'll introduce Amaka Agbo. Uh, we are neighbors, okay, she is based in Oakland, California, I'm now in San Francisco. She is CEO of the Katali Foundation. She practices philanthropy according to a framework she developed over the years on the ground, a framework she calls restorative economics, focused on supporting community-owned and governed wealth building initiative, initiatives. She first cut her teeth in community organizing, working on the Green Collar Jobs Campaign, as well as electoral campaigns and policy and advocacy work on racial, social, and environmental justice. 
Um, she graduated from UC Davis with her bachelor's in sociology. She then studied financial management, I'm sorry, sociology and African American studies. She then studied financial management and received her master's at San Francisco State University. So that's their bios. Let's give everyone a nice round of applause to welcome. So on my podcast, Art of Power, something that I really enjoy doing is getting into case studies. Uh, in part, it's my need for stories to follow anything as opposed to theory. Uh, and I also just like understanding what did it look like to change something I can visualize, okay? And so I wanna start now with Archana. You, well, our entire country witnessed a political transition when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris came into power. And you saw it as a specific opportunity to do what? Ah, so uh, when President Biden took office, um, one of the things that was so amazing is that he unlocked historic amounts of public resources. Um, in the US, that's $4 trillion. Um, and that came in the form of different forms of American legislation, including what's called the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Bill, um, and the new Climate Bill, also known as the Inflation Reduction Act. And the idea is that that $4 trillion um, would do lots of things, including, number one, propel racial equity in the United States, number two, reduce carbon emission and greenhouse gases, and number three, create good union jobs. But the idea is that that trifecta will never be realized unless there is a whole of both government approach as well as like civil society coming together and specifically philanthropy coming together to ensure that those resources go to the intended sources. One of the things that's really clear is that oftentimes money that is um, intended to go to specific sources don't, that it doesn't happen. Um, it, sometimes it reminds me of like trickle down, trickle down um, politics. It's like the money that was supposed to happen. That you know, like trickle okay. down, <laughs> down it doesn't work. Um, so the idea that um, the resources that were supposed to go towards equitable outcomes um, and specifically going to low income communities, BIPOC communities, people of color, um, it will only happen with specific intervention. And so I created Hyphen two years ago um, in order to build these co-investment strategies specifically between the Biden-Harris administration and private philanthropy. So I can share a little bit more about what Give that like an looks example like. so oh, we understand, example. well, how did you do, like, what yeah. did you do? Yeah. Um, an example. A brief example. Yeah, a yeah. brief example. Um, mm -hmm. There's an initiative called the Initiative for Inclusive Entrepreneurship. Um, the idea is that the American Rescue Plan refunded what's called the State Small Business Credit Initiative at $10 billion. So $10 billion was supposed to go to support entrepreneurs of color. But the idea is that unless there is some specific interventions and some structural change, that $10 billion isn't going to reach um, BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, and, that's and people classic. of color. It's who hears about it? How do you tap into What are your, your networks? How do you know to tap into the money? That's exactly yeah. right. And so the idea being that if you're able to build a co-investment strategy, when philanthropy and civil society comes together to ensure that that $10 billion reaches um, entrepreneurs of color, it can happen. So if there's an initiative, 18 months, we sprint because the White House operates in like one day at the White House equals a month um, in regular mm -hmm. time. And so we have got 18 months, we're three months in, 15 months left um, to really essentially shift the entire entire ecosystem of, um, of the deployment partners and build their capacity to expand capital access for entrepreneurs of color. So 15 mm -hmm. months for a 10-year initiative, and we're just sprinting. That's great. So example. That's great. <laughs> there will be more. N Nana, when we spoke on the phone in advance of this convening, um, you told me that when the world began shutting down in the pandemic, you had a choice to either hunker down, and I have this image of, you know, get dal, get water, store it, try to just survive until the end, hunker down, or expand, use this as a moment to grow, grow, grow. And you chose expansion. Explain that crazy choice. <laughs> yeah. Well, firstly, um, thank you, it's great to be here, and I wanna do a special shout out to Skoll. Look at this panel. We're all women of color, and we're all women. Oh, great job. Oh, doesn't happen very often, not even in our sector. So, so really well done. Um, yeah, it is a choice, right? And for those of you who run nonprofits or social enterprises, um, it's, a, it's a very stark choice that stares us in the face every single day. 
As a nonprofit, we're constantly terrified that we're not going to have access to money and we're going to go out of business. So when something like the pandemic happens, our first knee-jerk reaction is, oh my God, let me just hibernate, let me just save what I've built. But we were different. I, I um, you know, as, uh, as Aarti introduced me, we are, we are a nonprofit network. We're the largest social investing network in Asia. And um, we decided we wanted to go big. We thought this is when we, we are needed the most. We're a funders network and our mission is to move capital towards impact. How much more capital do you need to move towards impact than when you're in a pandemic? So there was no choice. And you your have board to. agreed, they just said yes. Yeah, my board agreed. Um, again, look at the women that are on this panel. It's hard to say no to us. <laughs> Um, a lot of people who I know here, close friends, will say it's very hard to say no to me. <laughs> but explain a little bit for the people who don't personally know you. Um, so I think, I think you know, it, um, why do we do what we do? We do, when you, when you are driven by impact and when you are driven by purpose, you, are, you have the conviction, I believe, that you can really explain, communicate, and transform as you go ahead. Um, it's also, I mean, this forum more than a lot of the others that I sit on will understand and I think will, uh, will appreciate. As entrepreneurs, risk is a way of life. Mm -hmm. When it's a business opportunity, the three of you come from California, uh, every, every um, VC is very happy to support risk, right, for business. We're, we're much less risk, um, we mu we're, we're much more risk averse yeah when it comes to nonprofits and when it comes to impact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I also believe this really strongly that as social entrepreneurs, as nonprofit leaders, as people who work on the community on the ground, we hold power. Mm -hmm. And if we want to really drive change, we have to take and, and, you know, grasp the opportunity. So the opportunity was there, we grasped it. My board was supportive in terms of us uh, pushing forward as, you know, uh, investing in risk. And, and we went forth. Mm -hmm. And then just if you can describe to me a little bit then, what did going forth mean? What did you do? So, you know, uh, for any of you who run a network, networks mean getting in touch and meeting people. Before 2020, we didn't do that many Zooms. We always thought getting in touch with people meant this. We sat in a room and we talked to each other. We held hands, we hugged, we did all of that. <laughs> uh, it changed, right? Uh, so how do you run a network and how do you run a network across Asia that actually uh, connects 17 different countries uh, without meeting them? So it's, it is a pivot. You try to think about how do, you, how do you do things on Zoom. Now, there are some funders here. How do you fund organizations that are in the most need and that need help without really knowing where they are? without really seeing them, without going out there and personally doing due, due diligence. Mm. The biggest uh, obstacle to mm. philanthropy is transparency and trust. Mm -hmm. And trust often comes is because I know somebody, I've met you, mm -hmm. and I, I have a connection with you. Um, Shiv, who's sitting there, Shiv, wave, uh, actually ran an amazing opportunity, uh, he's one of my members, uh, ran an amazing thing called Colab, which reached every district in India in, in terms of providing COVID relief, in terms of looking at how do, you, how do you overtake vaccine hesitancy? How do you get support to the ground? So, and you did this in a time when we had the biggest lockdown that the world that any of us have ever seen. So it's, it's really looking at grasping that opportunity and saying, how do we get help to where it is needed most, given the huge amount of obstacles that are sharing, staring at us in the face. And how do we actually move capital now, mm -hmm. urgently, when it is needed the most? And then the third part is how do we shift the way that we information gather? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that we're able to do How that. do we use technology? And, you mm -hmm. know, I think for us, for our sector, we have really made a leap in terms of how we use technology for good. Mm -hmm. the, these three years have really shown us how to do that and how to leverage that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Amaka, we were just talking about Richmond. Richmond, California, which is nearby the both of us, is a very industrial town. It actually became the place where during World Wars ships were built. And it's in some sense also become a bit of a pollutant wasteland. You invested $2 million in an organization called Urban Tilth 
talk a bit about them, how you found them, what you're doing with them. Sure, yes. I'm happy to chat about it. And you know, to, to be really specific about it, I would say that the Katali Foundation um, invested $2 million. And the reason I wanna lift that up is because our mission as a foundation is to redistribute all of our resources, 445 million, to support the political, the economic, and the cultural power of black, indigenous, and all communities of color. Um, so I lift that up because the mission is important to the specificity of who we support and how we support them. Um, so Urban Tilt is an organization um, located um, in North Richmond, um, and it is in a food apartheid desert. So for those of us that had the opportunity to see the descendant screening last night, we know what it looks like when you have oil refineries next to where people are living. Um, so Urban Tilth is located next to the Chevron Richmond oil refinery. Um, in which 20, exploded. Oh, which exploded in 2018. Um, and so we saw the pollutants go up into the air. We saw so many community members be rushed to the hospital. So the work of Urban Tilt is important because not only um, was it an organization that provided access to safe and healthy food for families during the pandemic when everything was shutting down and many of us had the opportunity to stay indoors, it's also an organization that provides training and job opportunities um, for young adults um, in Richmond that don't have access to opportunities. And it's also an organization that's really helping to stem gentrification um, that is happening all throughout um, the Bay Area. And so the impacts are important to state specifically so we understand what is at stake when we actually don't invest in these organizations. And so what we look to do at the Catali Foundation with the Restorative Economies Fund is think about what is the integrated capital that we can provide to support black and brown led organizations. Um, so we want to really recognize that the racial wealth gap is not just a gap in investment capital, but it's also a gap in access to the skills, the knowledge, the expertise the black and brown communities have been locked out of because of the structural racism that's embedded not only in our financial system, but so many systems. And so the Catali Foundation, we had just been doing one year of grant making um, before the pandemic happened. Um, and when, we, when the pandemic happened, we really recognized we needed to provide rapid response support um, to organizations like Urban Till. So our relationship with Urban Till started um, by providing a $20,000 grant mm -hmm. to support them as they were providing um, community um, food um, to the lo local neighbors. Mm. From there, um, Urban Tilt had the opportunity to actually purchase the land that they had been leasing um, from the county so that mm. they could actually own um, this piece of land, so that they mm. could figure out how to build structures and big, figure out how to build businesses that would sustain. So we then came through and provided them with a $45,000 grant. Um, and over the years, we- And that was down payment for the land? That was down payment for the land. Okay. Um, and then we also provide them through our Environmental Justice Resourcing Collective, um, half a million dollars um, in general operating support over five years. Mm -hmm. And then this year, you know, as we're talking about um, inflation and what's happening in the United mm -hmm. States, we came back and then also provided them a $50,000 grant as a fortification to support so many communities that actually don't have the resources that they need to deal with the rising costs of food and rent. I lay this out because while those numbers might seem small and insignificant to some of us in this room, what we know is that it built up the capacity for an organization that's been doing this work for 16 years. And then it made it possible for us to come in and then provide them with a $2 million investment at 0% over 10 years, mm -hmm. a long-term patient capital investment in which we use the restorative economics framework as the non-extractive due diligence tool where we're able to actually talk about what are the social impacts of the project. Yes, we do the financial, uh, sorry, the financial due diligence, but we really want people to understand and we want to memorialize it in documentation, what is at stake for this community. And then by doing that, we were able to bring um, some of our sister organizations into the deal as well. So we have the Olamina Fund, and we also have the Lieber Foundation that each respectively took our term sheet, um, took our credit memo, and each also gave a million dollars at those same terms. So sorry to like throw all the numbers out there, but specificity is important when we're trying to reach impact. 
and we actually can figure out how to structure investments that meet the needs of communities rather than trying to have them contort their mission to meet our financial returns. And so we mm -hmm. are so excited to support so many projects mm -hmm. um, like Urban Till. And then just one follow-up from sure. that. Does then that approach as opposed to, you know, here's our RFP, contort yourself to fit into this, is it that you have a long-standing relationship and basically over time, like how do you do that last thing that you just said sure. operationally? Yeah, yeah um, so you had mentioned I come from a community organizing background and a consulting background. Um, so I've known this organization prior to taking on this role at the, mm -hmm. um, at the foundation and that level of relationship allowed us to understand what's needed to support them. Mm -hmm. So this piece around leading with mission first the role of philanthropy is to figure out how do we move our dollars that we have a lot of power um, and oversight over to, to organizations so that they're actually able to stay true to their mission rather than having to contort to the metrics and the financial returns of others that may actually not see the value um, in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So by providing um, subordinated investment, we set the foundation and then make it possible for these organizations to negotiate what they need on their terms rather than figuring out how they have to contort to an RFP for other investors. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I think, um, you know, one of the things I want to add to what, what you just said is, uh, you know, one of the ways to do it is really broaden who's at the decision-making table and really bring the community organizations onto that same table. And there are funders who are doing that. And one of the things that we did, which was different when we, when we pivoted, was to actually go out and have pooled philanthropic funds. I run a network of funders. How do I aggregate funding from these, um, from these funders, mm. put it together in a pool, and then give out that pool in the way that is aspirational, that is where you want other people to follow. Mm. So how do you actually make that decision making of that pool more equitable? You actually include beneficiary organizations in it mm -hmm. so that they have a chance to say, how should it be structured? Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. Right. You actually talk to the people who you're trying to impact to see what is the best way to create that impact. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do more of that? Mm -hmm. You've made an interesting observation about how these pools work in terms of human behavior, which is that you're operating in Asia where there may be, compared to the West, uh, more risk aversion, uh, a different kind of culture of giving. And you say that when you bring people together, they're willing to take riskier bets. Explain a little bit about what you've observed and how you've kind of I want to say manage, I really am thinking manipulated in a good way uh -huh. that. <laughs> um, no, no manipulation. Sure. Uh, when, sure. When you, so what is, what is interesting is when you bring people together, they tend to be more courageous. They lose fear. Every organization that's part of our pooled funds doesn't do unrestricted giving in their real life. We do only unrestricted giving. As anyone who has run a nonprofit, what is the, what is the value of money that you get that is not tied? that is worth its weight in gold. And honestly, for, for, for people in the, in the impact sector, it is the only sector in the world where non-experts tell experts what to do. <laughs> so, to your point, if you're trying to impact communities on the ground, uh -huh. ask the communities. Uh -huh. Design the impact strategy with the communities. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm writing the check, I do not know how to solve for hunger in a food desert. I do not know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to them to see what is the problem. So how do you do that? How do you actually design? So we design, a lot of what we do is actually have a very consultative approach. And you know, it's, it's tough to say no because Instinctively, you know that this is the right way. So it's easier to do that when you're in a community mm -hmm. than to say, I'm going to do this on, on my own. Yeah. I'm going to try to explain to my foundation board why I want to take this risk. Yeah. But if I say, hey, I'm in a group with the Gates Foundation, with Tanoto Foundation, mm -hmm. with so-and-so, and they all know what they're doing, and that's why I'm doing it. No, it's such it's a just so much choice. easier. It's so right? clever, really. So, yeah. you know, not many, but it's just you know, you, that effective, a hand goes up. 
than another, than another. Exactly. We are here together. And you're uh, creating a movement. Yeah, I was going to say the only other t context where I can think of non-experts guiding experts is when men tell women things about mothering and, and birth. But that's okay. <laughs> Just one other sector. <laughs> you know, each of you, I think of each of you in your work as code switching a lot between the organizations, the people on the ground, the people with a pulse, and then the deep pockets. And I'm wondering if, I, if any of you have thoughts about code switching and what that's meant for you, what that's looked like in building resources, in no particular order. Yeah, I'll, I'll edit and say maybe um, not code switching, but translating. Hmm. Um, and I would say translating because um, coming out of a direct background and experience of working with community-owned and government projects on the ground, and many of them in Oakland um, that I've supported, um, I do recognize that the power and privilege that I have as someone who went to you know, university, um, went to graduate school, is to really take the take the strategies that community-based organizations are using on the ground and really understand, well, what does that mean for the financial systems um, that we know um, are outdated and need to be changed, but then how to actually have a conversation with people who have access to resources and figuring out how we actually structure that. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I just want to add a detail, mm -hmm. I mean, just for context for people mm -hmm. who aren't aware, the specific family that funds Katali mm -hmm. is the Pritzker family which is you know, on the Forbes list for one of America's 10 most wealthy families. I mean, we are talking yeah. about big money. Yeah. And I just started to imagine what it looks like for you mm -hmm. speaking with them. Yeah. And, uh -huh. You know, I, I will say when it comes to the family that I get to work with, um, one of the reasons I don't have to code switch and I get to translate um, and I get to be myself authentically in every space, um, piercings, tattoos and all, um, is... <laughs> Because our donors have done their work on their race, their class, and, class and their privilege. Mm -hmm. And so when Regan and Chris and her mother Susan created the Katali Foundation, they wanted to do something that was both aligned with the values of Libra Foundation, but distinct in that we are a spend out foundation. And again, I, I say that I don't like to get in the debate between spend out and perpetuity, but being a spend out foundation gives us the flexibility to prioritize the social impact of our work over the financial returns that we need to sustain the foundation. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, I actually get to have direct and honest conversations with Regan and Chris. Um, they have actually come um, to the farm and met Doria, um, the executive director of the organization. So there's an element of what does it mean to continue to put women, women of color, immigrant communities, um, transgender communities in a role where we have to code switch rather than being able to do our own work to understand how we meet the needs of those communities so that we can translate our field into the resources that they actually need mm -hmm. under the terms that they need them. Mm -hmm. I love that question about code switching mm -hmm. um, because so many of us do it naturally. And so the fact that there's a name for it, I'm like, ah, it's like when you name it, you're like, you can acknowledge it. Right. One of the reasons why I called hyphen hyphen is the idea that so many of us hyphenate. We liaise, we introduce, we organize, um, we liaise, we, um, we do the thing that needs to happen in order to get it done. And oftentimes that's really behind the scenes. It's incredibly, it's usually, um, it's not acknowledged for work. Um, and I was like, I want to name it hyphen to acknowledge that um, in this case, public-private partnerships do not happen without the hyphen, literally. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's so interesting about being the hyphen is that you need to be able to make sure that the people on one side of the hyphen are really eager and excited to talk to the other and engage the other mm -hmm. side of the hyphen. What's really interesting is that, as you can imagine, the Biden-Harris administration has a very different culture than private philanthropy, and private philanthropy has a very different culture than the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And so the best part about each of the hyphen, on either side of the hyphen, is that you can leverage either one of them in order to propel both of them forward. And a different culture how? 
and a different culture. So I think a lot about time. So um, when I worked at the, in the Obama White House, um, uh, literally breakfast, lunch, and dinner felt like a month. So um, the time between 8 and 11, 11 and 3, 3 and 6, 6 and 8, and of course 9 to midnight. Um, those are, it felt like those are every single day, isn't it? How much work you get done in those three hours feels like a day, a week, a month. Um, as, some of, as many of you know, and work in private philanthropy, um, the clock is a little bit different in private <laughs> philanthropy. <laughs> um, a really incredible colleague who works at an incredible global philanthropic institution oftentimes says that um, philanthropy's clock is a calendar year. And so one of the things that's been really exciting is to make sure that philanthropy, how you align or use philanthropy's like very strong due diligence um, and deep desire to be very thoughtful around the investments and the administration's job to get as much done as possible in four years. And so it takes a hyphen in order to make that happen, in order to translate. And so one of the best parts of it is that um, you can ensure that private philanthropy is, ins is ensuring that the administration is thinking longer than a month, six months, a year, four years. And how they do that is through the resources. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you can have skin in the game around the resources that you have to be able to do it. And so I really appreciate the idea of code switching because we all do it um, in order to get you done. Mm -hmm. And so by naming it and then owning it and honoring it, um, you're able to move the work forward exactly. really fast. My value proposition is I will help you guys sink. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. exactly. Right. And mm -hmm. one of the things that's interesting is that there's lots of spaces um, to connect and to talk. But I find that most people don't want to organize money. And one of the things I realize mm -hmm. is that organizing the money is actually power. And I know that you know that quite well. And you know that quite well. And so the idea is that the resources is actually what's going to lead to equitable outcomes. Um, and I, we, John Bridgeland, who I think is here, we talked a little bit about um, when you work in incredible global civil society organizations, I used to say that like good ideas are a dime a dozen, but the idea is that um, you need a plan to execute. What's your, what's your plan to get the vision to the outcome? Um, and I'll, and I'll, maybe I'll end with this. It's like, um, there's a quote that says, a vision without a plan is just a hallucination. That's so great. And so yeah. one needs to be able to have that big, audacious vision. That's such a great way to put it. Before I was a journalist, I was a community organizer as well. I spent my first career in post 9-11 New York City organizing immigrants being deported from the US. And it sounds like I was hallucinating a lot. So. <laughs> I love it, but sometimes yeah, you, it takes a minute to get there. Right, and right, you got right. there. Nina, may I just ask you about this? Because when I was thinking about code switching, frankly, I was thinking about you and your work. Um, and maybe actually that would be the wrong term to use, but you know, you work on a continent that's producing more billionaires than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't talk about changing the world. Like, you know, I come from a place where it's like, disrupt and append and change and da 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 da. And culturally, you're in a really different context. Right? Yeah, we don't talk much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, it's culturally, Asians don't, don't like to talk about, about their giving and about their philanthropy. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for most of Asia, whether you're from China, whether you're from Korea, Japan, India, Taiwan, any country. Um, you've always given. Philanthropy is a way of life. You, you give to your church, you give to your temple, you give to your community. And giving is not just for philanthropists, it's for everybody. So you don't talk about it because, you know, it might affect your karmic credits in the next life <laughs> if you go out and talk about it. So, you know, um, it, I, I'll, I'll tell you something, my, when I was growing up, my, my grandmother, and, and she was a very wise woman, she, she had no formal education, but she used to tell me something that, you know, do good and throw it in the well. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you grow up with in Asia, is that do good, throw it in the well, don't talk about it. You've done it, if you talk about it, it tarnishes it. So we don't talk about it, we don't. Mm -hmm. And also now, if you really think about it, yes, we have more billionaires or we will have more billionaires, but we are also in, um, in a part of the world where it is a little dangerous to talk about your wealth mm -hmm. and about how you are, what you are doing with it because you don't want to draw attention to yourself for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why you don't talk about your wealth. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, uh, um, you know, those who don't, um, we, have, we have some of the largest uh, 
uh, Muslim majority countries in the world. And uh, religious giving is a very big part of, uh, of philanthropy in Asia. And um, that's another giving that we don't talk about, they don't talk about, and it's not discussed in rooms like this, because religious giving is something that, that we treat at an arm's length. Yeah. But religious giving, especially in Asia, has a huge opportunity to make uh, outsized impact. That you're tapping into? That we are now tapping into, and yeah. we're also saying that, you know, um, there's no reason why philanthropy has to be secular. Why? Hmm. I mean, philanthropy has mm -hmm. to change lives where it's needed the most. Mm -hmm. It has to be money that is catalytic. It has to be money that is innovative. It has mm -hmm. to be money that has to have an urgent desire. You talked about philanthropists taking a year uh, in their calendar. Why do we accept that? I mean, you know, we talk about disruption. There is no reason why philanthropy should take a year. Since 2021, January, and now, we have done eight philanthropic pooled funds, and we have given away $14.5 million in unrestricted funding. It doesn't take that long. Mm. It does not take that long. Mm. You know, it's amazing to me because that challenge of silence around giving, like I, I, you know, I once interviewed President Barack Obama and he's shared something about how he thinks of power. He thinks of it differently from when he was younger. When he was younger, he thought power was organized people and organized money. That's the formula. And as he's gotten older, what he's come to realize is underneath the people and money is the power of narrative. The story you tell is the thing that activates the people and the money. Yep. And so when you operate in a context where people don't want to tell those stories, it is a barrier, an interesting barrier. So the question is, who, are, who is telling the stories? Mm -hmm. Is it the person with the money telling the stories, or is it the person on the community who's driving the impact telling the stories? Mm -hmm. And part of what you need to do and you need to think about this is, you're a phenomenal storyteller. But if I'm a nonprofit, I can't get to you. Mm -hmm. I can't get you to tell my story. Mm -hmm. But if I'm Barack Obama, I can get you to tell my story. Right. So how do I, as that nonprofit on the to ground, tell your story if you're Barack? Oh, Obama. Yeah, exactly. yes. that's the true. That is that's the power Let's dynamic. Yeah. So how do I shift the power to someone who mm -hmm. is actually changing life for her community mm -hmm. in a small village in East Java in Indonesia, where her river is completely clogged by plastic mm -hmm. that is actually shipped from? North America mm -hmm. to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, she's never seen these brands, but the river is choked. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, she's trying, she's 11 years old, there's a, there's a YouTube video, and I'm happy to share the link, where she's like, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. haven't asked for this, and I'm mm -hmm. growing up living with this. But there isn't anyone there to tell her story. And to amplify it, right? And to amplify her story. Right. So if you give unrestricted funding to a nonprofit, to a community-based organization, they can choose to use that money to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. We're going to begin to open it up for Q&A for, for Q from the audience. So we can, I think there's a gentleman going off the mic. If anyone has a question, just start to think about it. I'll ask one more. And then maybe if you raise your hands, we can start to get people aligned for their Q&A. Uh, one more question I have before we turn it over to our audience is, uh, there are a couple of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley whose work I've followed for a decade. Their names are Mitch Kapor and Frida Kapor Klein. They rank in the top quartile of returns in investment capital. So they are among the most successful VCs. And they are specifically dedicated to diversity and inclusion and upending some of the norms of Silicon Valley. They are not who you think about when you think about venture capitalists. And they have a metric, or rather a way of gauging who they want to invest in as an entrepreneur. What they pay attention to with an entrepreneur is not, did you graduate from Stanford? They actually don't care. What they care about is what they call distance traveled. Where did you start, and now where are you? How far did you have to go? And then in addition to that, the thing that you want to do, the problem you want to solve, are you personally affected by it? Because there is a theory there that they have, or an observation, which is that if you have that trauma, you will actually work on it better. It's a fascinating take on what makes a skilled entrepreneur. What's your takes? Well, I, I, I can start again. Um, 
Yeah, no, no, the K-Pores. And um, I appreciate this piece around the distance traveled. And what I would offer is the communities that we get to work with, we know that we don't go anywhere alone, right? And so my take on it is also who are you bringing with you, right? Mm -hmm. And how are they also a part of not just making the decisions, the governance of the project, of the initiative, um, but also who owns it? Who's financially benefiting and how do they benefit? Um, so I appreciate this piece um, that Frida Image lifted up. I think with our, our work on the Restorative Economies Fund, we seek to look at um, being very clear about the ownership structure, right? So when we say we support community-owned projects, you actually want to know what is the legal entity structure? How are the profits being um, derived? And who is benefiting financially? Um, and then we also want to look at the community governance of the project. Who's making the decisions? How are those decisions being made? And to your point, mm -hmm. when we see that those circles actually overlap in both who owns, who's making the decisions, and then who is most impacted by the project, that is how we look at power, mm. right? Mm. Um, that is mm -hmm. where we see transformation happen and we deeply agree that when you are supporting communities to own and govern their assets together, mm -hmm. um, that you're making it possible for them to make decisions where we know they actually take the externalities that many of us might kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, put on the, the underside of the balance sheet um, into consideration um, when they are lifting up a project um, to support. And so um, I, I love that. And um, I hope Frida and Mitch will talk more um, mm -hmm. about how they think about who they support and why. Okay, message from Oxford. Yes, <laughs> please. Um, so I think, I mean, you know, that's, that's for us, we have members who support and invest in social entrepreneurs. Um, our network looks across the entire continuum of capital from philanthropy to impact investing. I loved that you quoted Sarani when you when you started. Um, and um, you know it's it's I think what you do support is is the lived experience. So so those social entrepreneurs who've actually lived the experience and have faced the problem that they are trying to solve mm -hmm. tend to have the most innovative solutions. They are also closest to the market that they want to actually take mm -hmm. their product to and they tend to succeed. But mm -hmm. as with any other business, you're supporting the leaders mm -hmm. and you're supporting what you see in that leader. That business might fail, but then the next one might succeed. So it's, it's about really having that, uh, I guess that faith to continue to support we tend to not sometimes lose that faith where, where social entrepreneurs are concerned. You're we, allowed to fail. You're allowed to fail. You mm -hmm. fail. I mean, just think about it, right? Yeah. You're trying to solve the most complex problems in the world, mm -hmm. solving poverty, solving for you know uh, livelihoods, solving for climate change with the, the smallest amount of resources, mm -hmm. and, and you're expected to succeed? Hmm. Not, not that easy. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you're like the most artful moderator <laughs> first of all thank you um thank you. and Appreciate thank you it's like the idea of like the distance travel just like so resonates with me um because the work that we're doing is so practical in 10 15 years we're going to have an accounting of where the four trillion dollars went in the u.s we can't wait for the 10 years to ensure that the money goes to the places where it needs to go so one of the things that i'm excited about right now is we have the ability to co-create where the resources go right now. And so we're evaluating in real time to ensure that the resources um, go to propel equitable outcomes and specifically the racial equity goals in, this, in the United States. The, the deepest desire to move at, with speed to reduce carbon emissions and the ability that all of those resources are creating economic vitality in communities and underserved communities. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, fo folks ask me all the time, like. Um, when will you know if the money is being spent? I'm like, that is the wrong question. <laughs> we need to know right now, we need to be ensuring that every dollar that's being unlocked from the Biden-Harris administration is going to all of the things that we needed to go to with urgency. But it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because oftentimes communities of color, urgency is used against communities of color. And so it is really, it's been really interesting to compel and organize and spur innovation at a quicker timeline, but recognizing that that urgency, oftentimes communities of color get left behind. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're trying to say is you have to be able to hold it. You have to be able to hold both the deep desire to advance racial equity 
that it just undergirds everything that we're trying to do. Because not only do I want a two fur, but I actually want a three fur. <laughs> and in order to get that three fur, you cannot weaponize urgency. You have to make it. You have to make sure that the communities of color, specifically the underserved communities, are are absolutely getting access to those resources and doing everything that you yeah. can. Because yeah. that is not why so many people fought so hard to elect a Biden Harris administration. Yeah. And so we and, and that accountability mechanism. This country, the United States, is going to find out very quickly in two years. Mm, interesting, interesting. Can I add so now, something uh, onto the innovation piece, please, really and quickly. then questions from the audience. Yes. Yeah. So uh -huh. this piece around um, the failure, as you were mentioning, I think I want to really lift it up because you know, coming from the Bay Area near Silicon Valley, what we see um, in that part of the world is you know the the adage of break things fast. Right, um, because when you break yeah. things fast, that's where you get to um, the richness of the next experiment you want to run. Right. Um, but if we are not willing to support indigenous communities, black communities, and actually engaging in failure, they won't tell the stories of what they learned, and then we don't actually get to yeah. innovate and figure out what comes next. Yeah. So failure is not a bad thing. It's actually part of how we transform, but do we actually see that people can fail and they're still worthy of care? And you support. Know, you know, it's so interesting that you say that because I remember when I first moved to, Sil to the Bay Area to cover tech, that was in 2013 uh, for NPR, um, and I learned Facebook's then Facebook now meta slogan, move fast and break things. I literally had in my head the image of a poster, one side a white Stanford mm -hmm. comp size student and the other side an African American teenager, mm -hmm. and I was like, how differently that would be interpreted. Mm -hmm. Just what it brings up in terms of unconscious bias, what you were allowed to say and what you were allowed to do depending on your cultural identity. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Audience, please. Um, oh, am I picking? Yep, sure. You're right by here, go ahead. <laughs> and then let's get some mics in the back over here. Is this? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, this panel's been fantastic. I'm Mary Hedal from Crisis Action, and I've been doing fundraising for social justice and human rights for the last 20 years. And two things that you said really um, just stuck with me. Um, the non-experts telling experts what to do mm. and the pace of philanthropy. So my question to all of you and to all of you is what can nonprofits, NGOs do to change that? You know, I'm so impatient mm. and I know that that is a bad thing for a fundraiser to be, but I am. Mm. So what it's can we not do? A bad thing. It's not a bad thing. More people <laughs> need to be impatient. More people need to get up and say it's not okay. Why? Why, why is it a bad thing? Not a bad thing. Okay, but what so should it. thank you? So okay, question, what should though, nonprofit? What can, what can yeah. nonprofits do to yeah. help to change this? I think nonprofits, and I, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm stepping in. It's something I really believe. Nonprofits hold power. You know, we philanthropists are because we are. They exist because nonprofits exist. A philanthropist gets to be a philanthropist because there is somebody at the end of that pipeline doing the work. It's time we get up and say, hey, we have the power. It's time you say, I want to work with you and not with you. And I will not work with you. You have to. I mean, why do we? We say that this is the power dynamic. It is. But it's up to us to change it. Mm -hmm. It has to start with one change at a time. You have to get up and say, I will not do this. So many of us who speak in panels, I know and I hope you do this, say I will not speak if it's a manual. At least I hope you do, right? I will not, I do that. I, I will not speak if I'm the only woman and I'm the moderator and that's the token choice. I will not do it. So we have to start saying, what is it that we are going to do? Use your words. My daughter is training to be a Montessori teacher. That's what she says, use your words. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take another question back. My question is first for um, Mamaka, but also for all of you. Um, Maheen Kaleem, Grant Makers for Girls of Color. Um, we, I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your interpretation of impact and scale, because you know, we are a funding intermediary. Um, one of the organizations that we resource, it's a trans-led organization, and they said, we want to do this program 
and we want to start with four trans women, indigenous and black, and we just want to give them stipends, and we just want to make sure they have housing, and we want to pay their cell phone bills, and also bring them into space and start to do some organizing and political education. Um, and they could not get any funding because the number four was too small. And also because they didn't have a straight, we don't know what this is going to lead to. Nobody's ever done this in our community. Nobody's ever made this outreach. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about how you all interpret impact and scale um, and where maybe, and this is a, an assumption layered into the question, where the danger is when the only thing is how many. Good to see you again, and thanks for that question. I think um, I think this is an important thing for philanthropy to reckon with, right? The way we talk about impact and scale still tends to be through a predominantly um, financial interest um, and financial return lens, right? So at the Katali Foundation, when we think of impact and scale, um, scale isn't breadth for us. Scale is depth. Um, and we specifically want to understand how are we shifting the material conditions of people's lives, right? And so when you say we're just giving them stipends for rent or just giving them stipends for cell phones or to eat, people deserve to be able to eat and to live in dignity and have shelter. And that is impact, um, whether it's four or 400. And so um, for us, the, what we also recognize is when we want to always have things scaled or we want to be able to replicate it, we fail to acknowledge the unique social, economic, and political conditions that differ from city to city, from place to place. And so our strategies for resourcing actually have to be conducive for what are the challenges that that specific community is experiencing on the ground. The last thing I'll say, or to link back to this piece we started about urgency, the urgency that we're seeing from people who want to move lots and lots of money now is speaking to the fact that they now recognize climate change is you know, a decade before us. Um, we are watching our financial systems crumble. Things are extremely hard, and so we want to be able to move 50 million. Right? We don't actually want to spend the time to move 50,000. But what a community might need is 50,000. And so this place of urgency, we actually have to confront, why are we now saying that you need to be able to absorb X number of capital in order for me to feel as though I'm doing my job? When what you actually need right now is 50,000. And if we can move at the speed of building relationship and trust over time, you know, if we want to go the tortoise and the hare of it, Let's take the time to move that 5,000, that 50,000, knowing that it will actually get us to that 50 million. But if we always want to jump ahead, we will continue to miss the opportunity to support four people in community together, and we will continue to see inequality deepen um, around the world. Let's take a question from the front over here. Oh, for, what please, yeah. Just and scale. Mike. So one of the things that's so interesting about um, scope and scale is, once again, like oftentimes scope and scale gets weaponized against communities of color, but I have a twist on the answer. Um, when I lived in New York City, um, I worked at a, a global foundation that was obsessed with scope and scale. Uh, and what's so interesting is that you, in order to get to the scope and scale, you actually need a, a theory on how you're going to get there. It just doesn't happen when you like wish for it. Like my kid wants a unicorn. I'm like, keep wishing, honey. But you can't. You, it's like the same way. It's like, how do we get to scope and scale? And for hyphen, the idea is that you get to scope and scale when it's appropriate and when you can partner with the federal government. Because at the end of the day, the federal government has the most amount of resources. It oftentimes mm -hmm. dwarfs the amount of pri um, private capital that's available from um, from philanthropy, from organized philanthropy. And so the key is. How do you, what, what are the shared interests which, um, in order to get to the scope and scale? However, I found that like during the pandemic, because so many people um, contracted, it wasn't an expansive time for obvious reasons, even though I appreciate the expansive thinking that you did during the pandemic. Um, the idea is that um, it became really popular to go after low hanging fruit. Yeah. And these days I'm like, screw the low hanging fruit. I want the highest, sweetest, most tastiest, fruit, which is oftentimes the high hanging fruit in the form of deep, deep structural change. Mm -hmm. And how you get to the deep structural change 
and it once again comes back when civil society partners with philanthropy, partners with the advocacy sector, and is able to partner with the federal government, the state government, and the local government. Oftentimes, those folks are at odds with each other, and you can be adversaries, um, but there's an old adage in Chicago, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. And so you have to be able to figure out where there's an opportunity to partner to get to scale, mm -hmm. even though the impact may be very community-based and community-focused, but together adding up with the work in Richmond, with the work in South Side of Chicago, with the work that's in Prince George's County in Washington, DC, it will add up to the type of scale yeah. that we each crave and yearn for around all the big things that we want, carbon reduction, racial equity, good yeah. union jobs. And so I just, I just I, there's a flip side to scope and scale um, because we all want that urgently, um, but trying to figure out how to get there. Mm, thank you. Let's take a question in the back. Yes. Hi, so to on this uh, piece first, um, I want to lean into the trust building um, that you were mentioning before, especially around the how do we um, build trust around difference and, and hmm. what it means for people that are starting the philanthropic field and have to deal with the myth of the charismatic leader that is always bringing the money in and bringing the money in. And that has been a big barrier, especially when we're dealing with structural barriers of racism, of global inequality. Mm. Um, I am a Latina. I have been dealing and leading a US-based organization. And one of the things that I have constantly been um, dealing with is that the more distance, cultural distance there is with the people that I speak to, the more difficult it is to build trust. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that in one year, the people that have been leaning, entrusting me and helping me build trust as a leader are women of color. Mm -hmm. Are the ones that say, hey, one call, oh my God, let's continue talking, and it actually continues. It's not the, you know, the usual courtesy of like, oh yeah, let's continue the, the, the conversation, and then you don't hear <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So one is, my question is, how do we massify the difference, the importance of difference in trust building. It's not something that we're seeing in philanthropy. Mm. Um, and it's something that we need to start leaning towards. The fact that we need to build trust and infuse of trust of those that are just entering the space to build more community. Thank you. Please. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll speak from, from our perspective. And that's where I think uh, for us, the network has played a big role in helping to build trust. So we have about 660 members who are all funders or resource providers of different types. So they each support different nonprofits. And, and we set up quite early in the day um, what we call a, a deal share platform where all our members are able to put grantee organizations that they have supported. And you know, so, so if I'm a starting out philanthropist, I can go to that deal share platform in, as part of our network and actually find an organization that someone else has, has supported. And that kind of cuts the, the time taken to build trust because you feel at some point of time that I'm, I'm hearing from a peer. And if a peer is supporting, and that helps to create that community of trust without putting the burden so much on the nonprofit, trying to go phone call by phone call by phone call. So that is what we have done. But uh, you know, I understand where you're coming from. It is, it is really hard. Hmm. Thank you. Does this side of the room have any questions? I don't think I've seen a hand go up, which is totally fine, because this side's popping. <laughs> The gentleman in the second to last row with the vest? Yes. Hi, uh, Hi. Jordan Fabianski. I run a, a venture philanthropy platform focused on systems change. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm conscious that um, fundraising around an action agenda is, is hard to begin with and telling stories that are community-led, visionary. Uh, but then ex telling stories about accelerating that agenda are even harder. Telling stories about the need for a process of dialogue led by communities to shape an agenda during a crisis that's even harder. Mm -hmm. And when there isn't a crisis, it's damn near impossible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
like I'm curious that the, you, your organizations are intermediating as a you know, hyphen. You're working on two different sides of these these different networks, but the facilitation process itself. If you could say a little bit about the realities and challenges of going through that dialogue when it's not clear yet what it is that you're fundraising for. Yeah, I was, I was I was distracted I'm by so sorry, no sorry. no it's all good it's all good it's apparently the overflow room that is also full and overflowing so we're making sure everyone has a chance to ask questions. Good job, trying. folks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello to the overflow room. Yeah. So with that, could you repeat it? Because I wasn't sure if she was Rachel was trying to ask me a question. No, uh, no problem. Could, uh, we uh, just one more time. Just repeat I, the last. The last part. part. I first I heard the first yeah. half of the question. Yeah. So um, when the agenda for action oh. is not yet clear, oh, yeah. and your need to fund the process. Yeah. Right. Some of the realities and challenges of, of that uh -huh. process. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I find really interesting right now is that there are so many people that want to focus on the problem. And it kind of goes back to the, the person in the back's question about how do you manage the, basically the patriarchy um, and the racism in, the, in your everyday life. And so one of the things I've been trying to coach other friends, and I, oftentimes I need the coaching myself, um, is to really focus on the outcomes that you're hoping to drive towards and focus on um, the, the steps it's going to take, aka the process, to, to get to those outcomes. When you focus solely on the problem, not only is it terribly depressing, it doesn't inspire people to um, understand that there are, there are the solutions. Um, in the US, as everyone knows, um, we have a terrible, painful um, gu gun violence problem. And what I have found is that everyone wants the, um, I mean, it is in fact just awful and terrible and horrific and painful and just grief inducing. And uh, so many folks are paralyzed by the, um, just like how horrible and painful it is. And there are real incredible solutions related to gun violence in the United States, um, and namely work to support community-based public safety advocates, um, people that broker truce and truce treaties, uh, truce uh, treaties um, in places like Richmond, in places like Memphis, uh, where primarily black and Latino and indigenous-led organizers are literally um, negotiating peace and truce um, as a parallel strategy to law enforcement in this country. It is quite successful. You, you see places in Newark, you see, uh, Newark, New Jersey, you see places like Baton Rouge, Louisiana, whose um, homicide rates and the gun violence has deeply gone down because of community-based public safety advocates or community okay. violence intervention collaboratives. And I say this because Hyphen ran um, and anchored the White House Community Violence Intervention Collaborative, um, a collaborative between the Biden White House and 15 philanthropies and 17 mayors and 51 organizations across the country. And so there are real solutions to massive problems around the world. And I think one of the things that feels hard and frustrating is that we're not lifting the solutions. Mm -hmm. um, we're constantly talking about the problems. Yeah, and so, I, I oh. do want to, as, mm -hmm. as your dutiful moderator, yeah, I please. actually have something to say about mm. this. I have a take when it comes specifically to storytelling and how you tell stories around mm -hmm. impact. And that is that I find this bizarrely um, big psychological wall between people on the ground doing things, be they business leaders or organizers or whatnot, and the media. There's this artificial sense that somehow we don't have relationships. Mm -hmm. When let's get real. The best stories happen because of relationships built over time. One of my very, very favorite um, stories about an important impactful organization's growth is the Harlem Children's Zone founded by Jeffrey Canada. <coughs> Jeffrey Canada, based in New York City, had the confidence and the intelligence to build a relationship with a seasoned journalist and allow that journalist to come in on his journey, building the Harlem Children's Zone with lots of disaster involved. He didn't try to maniacally control the narrative. There was an element of surrender in what he did, mm -hmm. having chosen someone who was worth allowing that to. There's a risk involved in it. But what happened is that Jeffrey essentially, Jeffrey Canada essentially, in what he was doing, as he was building this thing that you may have never have heard about, he was basically building a media machine around it. 
And so I would just highly recommend, think about case studies, acts of vulnerability, where you built a relationship that's not purely, we have a press release, are you interested? No one's interested in the press release. <laughs> Sorry. And it's not gonna get you a narrative change. So where are your relationships, and where are you psychologically in building those relationships? That's my two cents to people about building relationships with storytellers. Do we have a question from the overflow room? I'm confused about it. I'm sorry? Thank you for watching, please, <laughs> yes. Thanks, this is an amazing, amazing panel. My name's Joanna Kerr, I'm with uh, Makeway Foundation and we fund solutions and partnerships to help nature and communities thrive together, mm -hmm. primarily through indigenous BIPOC-led um, initiatives. I am hearing some amazing trends that you guys are talking about. So you're talking about basically the, ch the changing face of philanthropy, uh, we, we, as, we're, as we're witnessing. You're talking about more folks understanding that it's not just about scaling up, but it's about scaling deep, which I, I love that. We're hearing about more courage through pooled funding, and we're hearing about more unrestricted funding coming forward. Some people call it trust-based. That's still a, a, a debated term in terms of the trust question. And also about kind of the, the investment in narrative, and, and that, that's how that's happening. Um, I'm curious about what you think about the tyranny of silos, which I think a lot of philanthropy uh, continues to hold on to, where I'll fund this, but not that, but all of these, if you're tr actually committed to systems change, all of these issues are interconnected. And I'm curious about um, impact investment, which there's greenwashing or pinkwashing or, or you know, all of these things and, and how, where you're feeling about the trends around impact investing. I'm really just curious more about what you see in terms of trends going forward because you've shared so many really positive ones. So I think, um, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I only speak from an Asian perspective because that is, that is my lens. Uh, so there is, there is a lot of interest in impact investing. Um, you know, it is sexy, right? I, I do impact and I make money. I mean, what's wrong with that? But um, having said that, there is, uh, there is more capital moving. And you know, we celebrate that um, at the GIN last year at their annual conference, uh, they released the data that $1 trillion were now assets under management as far as impact investing were concerned. I mean, think about the total amount of capital that is there in, in the money markets and that are in publicly traded securities. $1 trillion is not very much. But having said that, one of the really good trends that we are seeing, at least in Asia, is the um, desire to use more blending mechanisms, to use philanthropy as catalytic first loss capital to try and bring in innovative financial solutions. It's a double-edged sword in my own opinion, because if you say I'm going to use the philanthropic capital that I have allocated in my budget to come in and be this innovative catalytic capital, then who's doing the bread and butter philanthropy? We still need the bread and butter philanthropy. Writing a grant is not boring, people. Write grants, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's, that's important. But at the same time, philanthropy at the best of times, best of um, intentions, is 5% of anybody's wallet, no matter how rich they are. We need to get to the other 95%, and therefore we need to get innovative financial instruments. Um, so Ronnie Cohen has been working with, uh, with the Harvard Business School to look at an accounting standard that actually incorporates impact into it. You talked about you know, uh, pink washing, blue washing, green washing, many kinds of washing, the laundry is really busy. But you know, <laughs> what, is, what is really important though is for us to have a uniform metric. If I'm out there and I have money at my disposal and I want to decide whether I want to fund education in Cambodia or health in Vietnam, how am I comparing it? And what are the metrics that am I using to, to measure? Um, the siloization is, is, it has to go, right? I mean, for us in Asia, climate is such a big problem. We have the most amount of climate disasters anywhere in the world. And yet you go to, you know, most people and, and most private sector philanthropists and they'll tell you, I don't fund climate. You know, I'm not a climate funder, don't talk to me. But yeah, you're funding recyclable waste, you know, you're funding um, electric vehicles, but I'm not a climate funder. 
you know, or you say, hey, you're a climate funder, what do you think about the intersectionality between climate and health or climate and gender? Oh, no, 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 no talking about gender. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a double, it's really one of the big ails and we need to break that. We really need to break that. I'm gonna take one more question from the front over here. You've been waiting patiently. Thank you, everyone. And I really appreciate not having a manual. And uh, usually <laughs> when I attend these, it's, I do leave with a sense of frustration because uh, there's a lot of rhetoric around what's, what's, what's going on. But this has been so encouraging and, and life-giving mm -hmm. for women of color who are social entrepreneurs. And I lead a social enterprise around business mentoring for under-resourced entrepreneurs around the world. And I heard a lot of things that are um, ch systems changing. And I, one thing I have is funders need to be thinking about this, their own systems change, you know, sort of like the term sheets that you talked about, unrestricted giving. And you talked, Nena, about using our voice as entrepreneurs, um, but where do we use that voice? I mean, I talk about it to everybody that I can meet that. When is there going to be a day when I can issue an RFP and I choose funders? I, I would, <laughs> and I'm not, on the, I'm not on the panel, I'm not on the podcast, and I talk to everybody that I know but I don't know how that change is going to happen because there should be where I'm issuing an RFP for the work that we're doing because it's all intersectional. Mentorship is not just about entrepreneurship. It's about climate change. It's about so racial justice. It's about women's issues. And only I can speak about that powerfully, right? Mm. So where, how can we get that voice, that collective voice? Because the people on the panel at wherever you go are the ones with the money for the most part. Mm. And then there are some heroes highlighted here and there. Mm. Mm. So how do we, ch that there's a paradigm shift that needs to happen, that five to 95 has got to happen. In the same way, those of us that are doing the hard work need to be in the position of power. Mm. Let's get Archana's some responses here, thank you. It's mm. is really good here though what you said, you know. I mean, we have, to, we have to highlight and focus the solutioning and the ones who are actually doing this. And there are a few, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think you should issue that RFP. Um, there's an organization called Runway um, based in the South um, in the U.S., and they actually have an RFP that specifies the type of funding partners they're looking for. Now, um, w some of us might not know that organization, but I would be interested in how do you actually form connections with other social entrepreneurs, other organizations that share your values, and do you start to actually set the standards for the types of investments that you want, for the type of funders that you want to partner with? Yes, yeah, some of the work definitely is about us organizing wealthy individuals and venture capitalists and investors, and some of it is also you standing in your truth unwaveringly. Um, and so I would want to invite you to, to do that. Um, we do not need to play small, yep. right? Mm, fill up the space. I'm gonna now ask a final question as we wrap up this conversation that I've thoroughly enjoyed and I appreciate folks, as well as in the overflow room joining us. Um, so I think of that overflow room are, are two people very special to me. My baby, who just turned one. Uh, I am bringing you meaning to bring your child to work day. And my partner, uh, he is by day a surgeon, but on vacation time, he is the caretaker of our child while mommy works, as it should be. As it should be, girl, exactly. So thank you for that. Um, my son is learning words. He probably will not yet understand what you have to say, but I am committed to playing it back for him as he gets older and as he learns and as he figures out how to solve the problems we've created. No pressure. <laughs> and something that I wanna know from each of you briefly is collectively you have decades of experience trying to solve problems. What have each of you learned about how power works that you did not know when you began your journey? as women, and especially as women of color, we're very scared to take power. We are, you know, um, as an Asian woman, I'm, you know, I'm expected, there is a stereotype, right? That you're quiet, that you will, you will, you will be in the back, and you will let the, let the man speak. You will, you will not, um, you will not be heard, you will be seen, you will, you will not take up all of this space. It's having the courage in yourself first to stand up and say, I deserve this. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to take that space. I'm going to occupy it. It's not, and you know, there was a question about why Asians don't talk. It's not about being boastful, but it is about having that quiet confidence that you can take that power. Mm -hmm. And having that belief, it starts with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It starts with that inner introspection that I can do it. And, and then, you know, you, you, and it's also important, if you have that, you need to start passing it around yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's your responsibility to make sure that everyone around you and then everyone around them and then everyone around them feels that they mm -hmm. have that power. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, please. No, please. I don't want to go last. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying if you go last. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would echo um, that so much of the world would say that people like us don't have power um, and would tell us that um, our work is to go and grab power from other people. Um, I would actually challenge that. And, um, and I do think that each of us has power, has agency. Now, whether we claim it and now whether we take the steps and actions to actually make that true and so is the work. And so um, I would say that I've learned that Power is not just about um, the ability to say what happens, but who is willing to do the work to make sure that they see it through. Um, and that is where we get to manifest our power. And that's what I would, the words that I would invite your one-year-old to hold on to it as they're, you know, Thank figuring you. out their letters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the thing that I've learned is that a lot of people confuse access with power. Mm. And I want mm -hmm. your child uh, to always know the difference between access and power. And for me, power is impact. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of folks, um, mm -hmm. whether it is in civil society that have power, whether it's mm -hmm. philanthropy that has power, um, people that work in um, the public sector and public service who have power. I think that a lot of folks think that the access and the relationships is power, but the purpose of power is actually to make change. And so I think that one has to be reminded and I'm reminded about who you give your power to and who you consider powerful. Mm. So with that, uh, back over to you. Very sage words. Thank you so much to the three of you. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Archana, Nena, Amaka. Um, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.